This is a photograph of Einstein's office on the day that he died. It shows an untouched office exactly how he left it. There are dozens of interesting things to see in the picture, but the first time I saw it, there was one thing I wanted to know more than anything. What does it say on his blackboard? Since then, I've been working with my friend and fellow physics YouTuber Path G to figure out exactly what is on Einstein's final board. In this video, we'll explore that blackboard and what Einstein was writing the last time he ever used it, and also share the story of how this image was actually taken. It's a really interesting series of events that go from the announcement of his death up to a photographer using a bottle of booze to bribe his way into the office. It's a story I didn't know until I saw this picture and went digging. Einstein died on April 18th, 1955 of heart failure after a pretty good innings of 76 years. He was working at Princeton University at the time and was absolutely a world famous name by the end of his life. When news of his death broke, most reporters and photographers headed to Princeton Hospital where he died. But luckily for us, one photographer, Ralph Morse from Life Magazine, saw how busy the hospital was and instead went over to Einstein's office at the Institute of Advanced Studies. There's a really awesome article on the Life Magazine website that includes this full story and an interview with Morse about the day that I'll leave in the description of this video, and it's really worth a read. In it, the photographer Morse claims to have stopped on his way to the office to buy a case of scotch, because apparently most people are happier to accept a bottle of booze rather than money as a bribe for their help. Sure enough, apparently all it took was a fifth of scotch, that's a 750 milliliter bottle of Scotland's finest whiskey, if you're like me and don't know what a fifth is. And the superintendent opened up the office and let him take photos. I guess it's a good thing he did all that too, because now we have this incredible snapshot into his life and his office, exactly as he left it, untouched and unchanged. Morse also took photos with the medic who did the autopsy, although this isn't Einstein's brain here and he took photos near the funeral too. There's also this really cool shot of the desk, which I also think is super interesting. If someone else wants to work out what all of these pieces of paper are going on about, I'd love to hear about that in the comments. For me though, the office picture with the whiteboard is the really exciting one. To be honest with you, when I saw the picture and wondered what was on the board, I assumed a quick internet search would solve the mystery for me and I would move on with my day. However, I spent hours looking and I found nothing. Seemingly, no one had figured it out yet. Interesting, the mystery deepens and things are about to get fun. After zooming in on the photo and trying to read what it said, the only thing I achieved was cursing the photographer from 1955 who didn't take these on a high resolution modern camera. What was he thinking? I mean, come on, this has like four pixels in it. How are we supposed to read that? At this point, I realized I'd need some help figuring all of this out. Luckily, once I'd transcribed as much as I could, I had some help from friends at the University of Portsmouth's Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation. Andrew Gao and Andrew Lundgren helped out a lot in figuring out what all of these symbols mean and what the heck Einstein was up to. I also teamed up with my YouTube buddy Path, who knows a lot of physics and makes incredible videos about it too, and things were really starting to make progress now. We also luckily have two angles of the board. This second one is closer, which is great, and seems to be taken at a later date. There is some damage to this side of the board now, and the papers seem to be missing. But all of the books on the right seem to be the same, and the writing on the board is the same too. Maybe someone was trying to move the board for safekeeping and accidentally broke this bit. I'm not sure what happened really. To understand what is going on on the board, we first need to mention general relativity, or GR, which is Einstein's most famous scientific breakthrough and is basically the best description we have for how the force of gravity works. It tells us that it doesn't behave like all the other forces we know about. They all work by transferring particles, so-called force carrying particles, move between things like matter, and when they do, they cause that force to be felt. Gravity seems to behave a little differently though. The theory of relativity describes gravity in a way that doesn't require the exchange of particles between objects. Instead, relativity says that gravity is just how objects experience geometry, or the shape of space and time. In general, objects tend to move in straight lines through space-time. However, objects with mass bend the space-time around them. And then other objects passing by simply move according to the shape of the space-time they're in. This is exactly why some of the funky looking arcs and rings in space are actually an illusion. 
the objects themselves aren't necessarily shaped like that, but the light coming from these objects will bend and warp around objects with mass on its way to our eyes. This process is called gravitational lensing. This description of gravity as the warping of space-time also describes why planets orbit the Sun. They would tend to move in a straight line through space-time, but space-time itself is warped due to the huge mass of the Sun, and the paths they follow are therefore curved as well. This is what Einstein showed that changed physics forever, his most influential legacy. But what was he writing here, on his blackboard, for the final time before his death? What was the last thing he was working on or explaining? Well, of course, it's impossible for us to know for sure what he was doing on his blackboard, and we're assuming it was actually him that wrote all of this in the first place. He could have been working on a new, cutting-edge idea, or he could have been explaining some homework answers to a student he was teaching at the time. For example, while trying to decipher all of the symbols and maths on the board, we've come to think that marks like this aren't part of the equations, but are him pointing as he's talking, drawing lines and arrows for emphasis. Another option is that he was explaining exactly why something didn't work. So just bear all of this in mind as we dive in. When Path and I really zoomed in and started figuring out what these symbols he wrote could be, we also noticed something really interesting and surprising. Einstein is using notation that he invented totally wrong. This really shocked me to be honest, but to hear more about it, check out Path's video about the blackboard that accompanies this one where we'll go into more detail about lots of the stuff on the board. Also, just look at this handwriting. He is not making this easy for us. While we have deciphered most of the board, some of it remains a mystery to us. Take this section, for example. I struggle to read much of it at all. And then there's this pretty obvious threat where Einstein just wrote the word killing. Ominous. I mean, this is almost certainly a reference to something called a killing vector, which is named after a guy called Wilhelm Killing, rather than being some satanic maths. But since we don't know what the maths around it says, we're not going to dwell too much on this now. If you can figure out what it might mean, then please let us know in the comments. We would really love to hear your thoughts. Now, we figured out most of this main stuff here. Usually, the equations of general relativity are written using a mathematical object called a metric, commonly represented by the lowercase g and two subscript letters, as we can see here. G -I -K is a metric. The metric basically tells you how to measure distances in space. Another way to think about it is that it incorporates information about how space and time are warped. The metric can be written in a lot of different ways. If this line represents the path that something, like a planet, would travel in space, the metric tells you how to work out the length of that path based on the curvature of space-time itself. So basically, the real cool thing is that it's not just the physical length through space of the path, but also takes time into account. And the metric tells you the length of what we call the space-time interval. Now, the metric is very important in GR. If we just put the famous Einstein equations of GR on the screen, even without knowing anything else, we can see right here, front and center is the metric. Hey, by the way, shameless plug, I've got a video discussing Einstein's field equations over on my channel, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, what Einstein seems to be trying to do on this board is rewrite general relativity so that instead of a metric GIK, it is written in terms of these new things here. This is a Greek letter lambda, with a sigma written underneath it and a subscript of either I or K. This represents an object called a tetrad, which can be thought of as a vector. Generally, we have a tetrad for each of the four dimensions being studied, three for space and one for time. Here, Einstein is just rewriting the metric in terms of these so-called tetrads. This thing in front of the tetrad is actually another special metric, one that's very simple and is called the Minkowski metric, represented by the Greek letter eta, and it's just needed to tie everything together, basically. The important thing here is that the tetrad vectors are usually one-dimensional objects. They each point in a single dimension. So an example would look something like this. It's just a single column of numbers, whereas the metric, for example, shown here, is two-dimensional. So we would have an array of columns and rows like this when representing the metric. We think that this might actually be the entire reason Einstein was trying to rewrite the metric using tetrads. Taking a two-dimensional object and writing it in terms of one-dimensional objects, the tetrads could come in handy. Hear us out on this. One of the great goals of physics is to unify Einstein's general relativity, which describes gravity, with quantum mechanics, 
the leading theory that describes physics on microscopic scales. This was the case in Einstein's later life, and it's still the case now. When we take a theory and show that it's compatible with quantum mechanics, we say that we can quantize the theory. For example, the theory that explains light is called electromagnetism, and it is compatible with quantum mechanics. We understand how to combine them. So we say it's a quantizable theory. It's also written only in terms of one-dimensional things, kind of like those tetrads we saw earlier. GR though is harder because it's normally written in terms of two-dimensional metrics. We don't know how to quantize 2D things like metrics in a theory like general relativity. So maybe Einstein was trying to rewrite the theory in terms of tetrads in an attempt to quantize it. Maybe he was working on quantum gravity here. That's what all of this maths here is basically doing rewriting parts of GR in terms of those tetrads, possibly in an attempt to make it quantizable. Or, as I said earlier, maybe he's written it here to explain to a colleague or a student exactly why that won't work. We have no way of knowing the context of why he wrote all this down. He then goes through a calculation here to show some property of one of the new mathematical objects here, which he denotes by a lowercase Greek letter gamma. Specifically, he's showing this gamma curvature-like term is anti-symmetric in two of its indices. But more of the detailed maths can be put into another video if enough of you would be interested in that. Let us know in the comments if that's you. So the question becomes, did it work? Well, probably not, because nowadays we still don't know how to quantize GR. So if this worked, it would probably be well known by now. Unless no one's figured out what's on this board and we're the first, in which case we'll accept our Nobel Prize now. He did successfully rewrite the equations, but it just didn't seem to help. That's what we think he's explaining over here, in this intriguing section with the words old and new. More details of this are available over on Path's channel, but it seems like he's telling us that rewriting it didn't simplify anything. He seems to be saying that rewriting a 2D array in terms of two 1D arrays doesn't actually change that much. He's moved some of the numbers and so-called degrees of freedom around, but that hasn't gotten rid of anything. So unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have given us a quantum theory of gravity with his final blackboard. Please check out the video that accompanies this one over on Path's channel. It has even more details about this blackboard, and if you'd be interested in an even more in-depth video where we go line by line through all the maths, then definitely let us know in the comments too. Huge thanks to Path for working with me on this, and thanks again to Andrew and Andrew at the University of Portsmouth for their help too. Be sure to subscribe to this channel if you're new, and subscribe to Path as well for tons of fun physics content over there. Give us your thoughts on all this in the comments down below, and definitely let us know if you can figure out any of the bits we missed, or tell us if you think we've gotten something wrong here. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.